Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Document Workflow Manager. In this week's training, I'm going to show you how to create this incredible document manager complete with drag and drop, complete with multiple different workflow types. You'll be able to automatically create thumbnails based on Word documents, PDF documents, pictures, and a whole lot more. I've got so much to share with you in this training, so let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining me today. I've got a really fantastic training called the Document Workflow Manager. If you've worked in a large company, getting documents approved or through the process between managers can be difficult, cumbersome, and a real pain. It's hard to get them up the chain of command organized and in a nice timely manner a good application to help us with this is a great strategy so how are we going to do that well we're going to use this document workflow manager excel is a powerful tool when we apply a little bit of vba some visual helpful hints like these thumbnails we can create a powerful tool for any type of combination when you add sharing and sync into this it can be shared in a shared folder across all the employees in a company and they can also have updated document management so that means when a document is created regardless of it whether it's simply time off or sales order or anything that you deem important for your company you can create this so that it passes through each manager each manager can then have their own revision they can write review notes and they can set their own status and you can also browse for any other file or you can simply move it to the next manager for approval just like that it's going to be a great training i've got so much to share Share with you in this application even if you're not really interested in creating a document workflow manager there are so many skills that you're going to learn in this master class including automatically created thumbnails including drag and drop including scheduling purposes or we have saving records data mapping and tons and tons of advanced filters and tons more i hope you'll stay with us through the entire master class if you do like these trainings i create these each and every tuesday absolutely free there's some great ways you can help us out simply by starting to subscribe don't forget to click on that notification icon bell we create these every tuesday so that'll get you notified of these brand new trainings each and every week this download application is absolutely free but using the links down below if you like to use your email or with facebook messenger but if you want 200 of my best applications i've got that available also in a single zip file that's that's just 77 dollars right now and it also comes with an incredible library and that means a single click to open the application or a single click to simply view the original training just like we're doing right now that's an incredible library i hope you'll set that up i'm going to create these for you so let's get started we've got a lot to cover i'm going to go line by line code for code in this workbook plus everything you need to know to be able to create your own document workflow manager or simply to create increase your skills to create your own applications in excel my goal is not just to make you successful with excel but to give you the tools and tricks and tips to give you uh, all of the things that you need to get your career started in excel or create your own applications for sale let's get to it the best way to start with that is just to give you a general overview basically what we do is when we have workflow types we can create unlimited types of workflow types when we select on a specific a document here all the information whether it's a document name the originator that's the person who first uh, requested it and the workflow type right? we also have the requested on the date and the original file name we can browse for it we can open the document simply by clicking on here it's going to open it and that's regardless of the document uh, we can then send it off to a different supervisor simply by either drag clicking on it dragging and dropping it or anything else so we can just move it along right here and it'll automatically move to a different thing or of course if there's no manager selected when we select on a document all the managers the supervisors in that entire chain automatically get displayed those particular supervisors here are based on the document type so notice there's no supervisor because we haven't selected an originator the first person based on this originator is that chain of supervisors so how do we know that well let's get into some of the fundamentals of this application and then i'll walk you step by step how we create it so we're going to start with the admin screen 
we have a shared document folder, right? We need to know where those documents are. What we want to do, if you use a let's say a Dropbox, your shared documents can be throughout the entire company. That means every single user could get an application like this. They can be shared throughout the entire company. If you share the data using one of my sharing and sync techniques that I've just demonstrated in an older video, you can then share and sync this application with them. It'll all be synced up. But we do need a shared folder. So we have that here. We also need a shared thumbnail folder. When we upload a file, we are going to automatically be created able to create thumbnails. So for example, if I browse for a specific file and I have, let's say, this receipt here or a PDF or anything or JPEG, and I want to create a thumbnail for it, it's automatically going to create a thumbnail. So when I save and update that, it is that thumbnail, which is this one right here, that automatically gets updated based on the document that we have done. So it's a great way to create those thumbnails. We're going to be doing, again, on PDFs, pictures, or Word documents. Even if you have a Word document, you can do that too. So we need to keep those thumbnails in a specific folder. So I've created just basically two folders here. I've got our documents folder here, and I've got our thumbnails here. So our thumbnails are created dynamically. They can be pictures or anything else. And our documents are uploaded and copied. So basically, when we a user simply clicks here, the browse, what that's going to do is going to look for wherever that's located, and it's going to upload that. So if I want to change that to a PDF, I just click here, PDF. It's going to automatically change that to a PDF. Save and update that. Notice that that thumbnail here got changed to a PDF, just like that. So we'll show you that. So we've got those two folders. I also want to know the company hierarchy. Who's the top of the chain of that company? Vice President. So we have, in this is generally, it starts out with an office staff, which is the lowest employee, and then it just goes up. Team leader, office manager, supervisor, regional manager. This is really important because we're going to have to know who is on top of who. We also have dynamic workflow types. Really, really cool because we can then create workflows based on that. So for example, maybe you want to request a time off. Maybe there's only two managers that are involved in this that has to be improved. But maybe you have a large expense, right, like above $1,000, and we need to get that approved by several managers here. So in that case, this type of workflow type will be different. So notice here, when we select sales order, we have a certain set of managers here. When we have a work order, we have a, just a few different managers, just five different managers, or an expense less, again, five different managers, and we have a larger one. We don't need this chairman here. When we have a larger one. We have a project bids or invoice. So we can create what's called dynamic workflow types, and we can do that inside the admin. So for example, the time off, we just have these four managers. We can then select which type of a manager. Again, sales order would be large. So here, what we can do is we can select all the manager, all this manager's type, at least their position on who's supervisor. It starts with the office staff, then it goes to the team leader, then to the supervisor, and then for the final approval, the regional manager. So we can, not only can we create any workflow types, we can then create the entire hierarchy of manager that has to approve that type. And what I've set up to, let's see, what do I have about here? Uh, nine or ten different ones here so it's really really great that we can do that and we can create that you can create more if you need it but i think it's a good start so then we have dynamic flows and then we have document statuses right what is the status what is the initial status the pending status when it's being reviewed or once it's approved or is it rejected or it needs revision and maybe it's finalized right so once it's finalized we don't want it to appear in here right so if we decide we're going to finalize a document right we want to set okay we're going to set this to finalize we're going to save and update that. We don't want that. That document's now gone. It's no longer here. So only those pending documents, that's going to keep us really organized. So it's easy to finalize a document. So we're going to have that too. So that's it for the admin screen. Relatively simple. We have our workflows, which we'll be going into detail. I've got a document database. This is where all of our documents are stored, right? Notice that one that we just said was finalized, right? We put that one as finalized here. But if we change that to pending review, it's going to show up again into to sales order. So our particular document list contains a document ID, a document name, the originator, the original staff that created that. We also have a workflow type, right? What is the type of the workflow? That we're going to need to know because they're separated based on workflows. So when I click sales order again, notice that appeared back here because we now set it to pending review inside the database. We have the work orders, right? We have expenses. We have uh, notice that we can use receipts and pictures. 
project bids and all and pretty much everything else we also have the quantity how many are here i want to have the quantity here okay so we have the requested on so all of the data the original file name and the thumbnail that gets automatically created where's that located i need the file name i know where it's going to be located it's going to be located in this folder here but i certainly need the file name i know the original file name the details or the notes of that that's going to be linked up who is currently reviewing this? what manager is currently reviewing this what reviewer position what is their position right are they the office manager who's reviewing this and what is the current status of the document is it pending review has it been approved does it need revisit you know does it need more review or has it been finalized or revision right sometimes we may want to also send this back to the originator right it's got to go back to the originator notice debbie was on the originator so if i want to send this back Back to the original i just click one button it's going to be sent back to debbie here notice i click on that again it's back to the originator or in this case debbie right debbie here back to there so maybe debbie needs to to uh redo it or something like that so you know it's been rejected and the manager can put some notes on that so single click to move it also again we can do use drag and drop we can move a document along just by uh, clicking on it and pressing this this mark next approve or we can send it back to the back manager simply by sending it back to the back so we can move these documents along the chain of the managerial approval process simply by doing this now i've never actually worked in a large company i get fired from most of the companies that i work for which is why i work on my own so thank you very much sammy for your advice and inspiration on this you helped me create uh at least the ideas for this and then i take it a little bit extra step so i don't know he knows how large companies act and so that, that that kind of helped me out so i kind of understand the process flow of that so thank you sammy and we're going to continue on inside our document review now notice that there's multiple reviews per document so we need to track those in a different list here right so we've got that and we also have the revision file we can add a file onto that notes and so we can add a lot of information onto that if we want to okay we also are going to need to show that i need to filter that in other words i want to know all of the revisions or reviews for a specific documents so we're going to need to run it through an advanced filter just like we do here so for filtering document a Eight, right document id 8 i only want those results going to come here and then those results are going to come into my workflow sorry so i know that these three types of reviews have been completed on this specific document that we've selected okay so that's why we need to keep track of this in a separate database i also have a staff list now now our staff list here is going to come with an id staff name a position a supervisor if there is any an email which we do i think i'm gonna think on our patreon platform i'm gonna add email automation to this so if you haven't joined our patreon now's a great time to do that every single week i create additional features for these workbooks and a brand new training video something that maybe is featured or something that is a fix or something that maybe i'll take a focus on and i'll put that on patreon along with a whole pdf download and uh, advanced uh, trainings and a whole lot more on our patreon so i'll include the links down below if you want to join Join us there and possibly a picture i haven't really used the pictures but i think you know there might be a way we can incorporate staff pictures which would be kind of nice here right wouldn't it so maybe i'll add that in too you know into the patreon so workflows maybe i kind of run out of space but maybe a staff picture here i got a little space there something or maybe maybe a little uh, circle staff picture here would be nice so i kind of put that in the database thinking maybe if you got some ideas i'd love to hear them so at least we have a column for staff pictures and then i've got the row the team members that might be helpful moving on but nothing that we need to do so what we do is we want to know their staff and we may want to put them through so we may want to run through an advanced filter but for our purposes in this training all we're going to be using is basically the name the position and that's it for this particular training and then i got a blank email sheet that just gives you an idea of where we might want to go with this right now it's blank but if you want to see this become active let's go ahead i might put some templates in here so got lots of ideas for a patreon platform uh, additional training all right so let's get into it so that's pretty much it an admin of workflows and two databases containing the documents and containing the reviews and then a staff list so that's it so how are we going to this well let's start with the basics right just a few things that i want to know we've got some named ranges that i want to bring to your attention because those are going to help us both not only in the formulas but in the code so let's go over some of the named ranges that i have created and that's going to be in the formulas and name management 
manager. Okay. Now these criteria, when you see these, these are created automatically by VBA when we create those advanced filters. So of course, most importantly, I've got a document ID that is going to be in dynamic named range based on the document ID. So as we create them using the offset formula, as we always do, offsets can help us. So as our document IDs grow, so is this list. So document ID, we've also got document status. I want to know the status of that. And that's going to be here on the right side here. Current status. So I want that in a named range. That's very important because when I count them, I don't want I don't want to know which ones have been finalized, right? I don't want to count that. I only want to count those that are currently working or in the process or moving up the chain. Anything that's been finalized, we don't need to count. So having that status is really important. I also have the document type. I need to know the document type. Sales order, work order, expenses, that's going to come in handy when we count them. I need to know how many sales orders that are not finalized and things like that. So that document type will be critical. Again, extract ranges, those of course are going to come automatically through VBA when we create those advanced final. Now I have one, I've got to create a named range based on a single cell. And that's going to help in VBA. That's our finalized named range. So that's just basically a final. We know that final is cause a bit. We also have the hierarchy. That's very important because we need to know the company hierarchy. And I also have one what's called needs review. So if needs, excuse me, needs revision or needs review, either one would be fine. Needs revision will stick with that's going to be a named range for a single cell based on B25. Same thing with pending here. Pending is also pending review. That helps us out in the code. And once we get into the code, you'll be able to see how having a named range on a single cell is very convenient. And it's also much easier to read the code. And we understand exactly by reading the code what that pertains to. And of course, rejected also, we have that too. So we have a few of them named range. Also have some uh, named ranges for the staff, including a staff ID, which is also, of course, dynamic named range. Same thing with staff name and same thing with staff position. So we've got those named ranges and I also want to know the staff supervisor. So those are named ranges based on that. And I have a status, all right? I want to know what the status is, all of the document statuses, name range for that. And then, of course, one for workflow types. Those are the workflow types in the admin. Again, using offset. So as our workflow types grow, so does that. So we can add and update workflow types. They'll automatically be linked here. So how do we do that? Well, we simply link it. Whatever's located here, you see if I select the large range, in admin D7 is going to automatically appear here. So it's basically link this list. I just basically copy this list and I pasted the links directly in here, pasting those links. That's going to link it up. Okay. So, but what I want to know is how many time off, how many sales order. I've got that quantity here. That's going to let us know. We need to know that. So, how are we going to count that? Well, we can simply use count ifs, IFS, document types based on what D16 is, right? I want to know all the document types for D16, but not every single one of them because I, want, I don't want to exclude those that have been final, right? If they're finalized, I don't want to include them. So, the best thing to do is basically say count ifs. All, another criteria for the second would be the document status does not equal final. This is that named range. Named range. Remember, we have a named range called final. So when I backspace this, we start typing it in, we see it is that named range. Remember, that's the same named range that I used right here. So when we click finalize, we see it's final up here. So it's, that's why it's much easier using formulas, much easier using code, because we can clearly see it. So it makes a lot more sense, as opposed to connecting that with just a single cell where we might not know where that cell is. So basically, all we're using is counters. That's going to let us know to count all the ones that we need, right? And if it's zero, we're just going to show nothing. So that's how we count ifs. Also based on, remember, it's all we're basing it on all the sales orders or all the ones for this, but not including anything that has been finalized, right? The status is not finalized. So that's it. That's all we have to do here. Now I've got some information in columns A and B for the admin. This is generally hidden. And let's go over some of the fields here. So what I want to know is when I select a document, how many filled in fields? Some of these, when I click a new document, right, I need to know I've got five fields that are going to be required. Document name, the originator, a workflow type, a request it on. Now, inside the code, I could do if F3 equals empty or H3 equals empty or, you know, it's a lot of code. Or what I could do is simply count the cells 
of those which contain text and put them in a number. And we can use count if for that, right? So as soon as I add one, it's going to count that. And I've got that formula right here located in B1. What we're going to do is we're going to count A, and that basically is count all the text of the following cells. Count the cells that contain the text. So of these five cells, we're going to count them. We, right now, we know we have one of them filled in. If we select a specific document here, we see that all five have been filled in, and therefore it's five. That way, in VBA, all we need to do to, to ensure that those five required fields are filled in is simply say, if B1 does not equal five, then let the user know. So just something like that. And we also use conditional formatting to color these yellow. So that conditional formatting, as soon as we see new document, as soon as we fill it in, it's going to go to white. That's using conditional formatting. And basically, we've just applied a single conditional formatting to multiple cells here. In fact, I probably just need a single one here. And uh, I'll delete one and I will update. So basically, this formula is just for these cells, right? And I'll include this one as well here. So all we need to do is just select the cells here and just make sure that if they're blank, cell contains a blank value that I want to color it yellow. So when we edit the rule, we see it's cell contains blanks and we're going to format that yellow. That's all we have to do. Right? So as soon as we select something, we see that they all go to white. Okay, so that's it for that. So we have that. Now we have a document ID. This is placed by VBA. When I select a document, that document ID changes. We need to know that document ID. That is the ID that's located here. So if you follow any of my trainings, this will look a little bit familiar. This combines a lot of trainings, such as the Kanban, which we created a few weeks ago, a great training. It combines thumbnails, which we created a while ago. It combines drag and drop schedule which we've created. So basically, we can combine all those skills together to make one very powerful application. So we got the document ID. Now I need to know the document row, right? I need to know that seven, ID seven is on row 10. So how do I know that? Well, I'm going to use match for that. So we're going to use if error, just in case it doesn't match, we're going to match B2, whatever's in B2, that's the ID, based on the name range document IDs, and we want an exact match. We're adding three because we know our first one starts on row four. So we always need to add three because I'm not looking for one, I'm looking for the row number. So in that case, it would be four if one was selected. Okay, I also want to know the thumbnail. Remember, for each document, we're going to create a thumbnail. It is that thumbnail picture that's going to appear inside this shape here. I need to keep track of that thumbnail. I'm going to put that in B5. Okay. I also want to know the original staff ID. This could be helpful moving forward. So the original staff ID is simply taking care of that. We're going to use index. We're going to index that staff ID. We're going to run a match based on that staff name located in H3. We're going to run that match based on the named range, and we want an exact match in the column one. If there's an error, it's going to show blank. So that's going to get us the staff ID. I also want to know the original. It's called, it's called the originator row. The originator, let's put in the word staff so we know that's the originating staff row and the originating staff position and their supervisor, right? So I want to know all those things. And I want that's because that's going to help us moving forward. So we want that all that information here to show up here. So to get that row again, we're going to simply use a match. In this case, we're basing it on the staff table. So we're going to add two. Why are we adding two in this case? When I find that staff list, notice our first one starts on row three. So if our staff ID is one, I know that add two to get three. That's going to help us with the row. So we know. And I also want to know what their supervisor. Excuse me. I want to know their position. We're going to use index. I don't, we don't necessarily need all these fields, but they're very helpful for when we add in features. So I want to know their current position. What is their position? So we're going to use, we're going to run an index based on their position. That's the named range we created. We're going to use a match based on that staff name. That's going to get us their position. I also want to know what their supervisor is. Remember, inside every single staff, there contains a position. It contains a supervisor unless they're the top of the supervisor. And we also have email and picture and a bunch of other stuff. So this is all for staff. When we change the staff on here, we know that we're going to automatically update that automatically. Okay, so everything's going to update on that. All right, I also want to know some information for the staff that's reviewing that, right? The staff, right? If I change, let's say we change, let's say we got Debbie and in this case, her reviewing her manager, Tina James, is reviewing that. They're just set for pending review, right? It's waiting for Tina to review that. So we want to know their information. So I want to know 
Stina's uh, staff ID number using uh, index match. I also want to know the row that where Stina, Tina is located in the staff and what position she is and who is her supervisor. So I want to know that as well. Okay, I also want to know the selected review database. When I select a review, I may want to edit one of these reviews so I can select on it and it's going to show up here. So that's very, very important. We need to know that. So I need to know what row is selected. In this case, it's going to tell us that row, in this case five, is going to show up right inside here. That is 17. This select review database is the database row that's located, right? So basically, we save this 34 on a database here, located in row 34. Take a look at that. Seven, right? That's the ID. 30 K Hopkins and pending review. So that is the database row where it's located. If we need to make an update, I need to know that review. I need to know the database, right? So what is the database here? So this keeps track of the database. That way, if I make an update, right? If I say test notes and I make that update, it's going to automatically save when we update that on row 64. So when we look at row 64 here and we can see that those notes have been saved right here in row 64. So we need to know what row and column to save that in so we've got 64 and we know the row so that's very very important okay so we got to have the database row now also we have the selected here's where we come in the selected flow row right what is the selected flow row well when i select here i need to know what is our selected right remember we have different workflow and i've got conditional formatting that appears on these right so i need to know what row appears notice it's 16 17 18 right so we need to know what row because it is conditional formatting is going to help us and again i've got conditional formatting based on these two just simply based on the selected row so as you see here b15 equals row that's the format that we've given it, that dark background along with the white bold font. That is the one that we use. And it's going to apply to D through E, so it applies to everything. All right, so we need to know that row. I need to know what type row, too, right? Notice there's a specific type. This is one type row. How do we know what that is, right? Time off is one. When I mean one, here, it's the first type second type third type right well, i want to know that because i'm gonna to have to extract that information so i need to know the type row so that's the row that's located on basically two three four so it goes on and then okay selected review row this is where that review comes in right here when we selected we just went over that that is the row that we're going to use if we select something that review row six because conditional formatting here is going to help us to highlight that row B17, B17 equals row. Conditional formatting, again, help us recognize what row we selected. In this case, it's B17. Okay, the last thing, this is going to come in handy when we go through the drag and drop macro, right? When I select a specific group, I want to know the left position and the top position because if it's been moved, I need to recognize that there's been a move. I need to know that it's been changed and I need to automatically update and refresh it and not everything. So I'll go through that with you. Very, very simple, believe it or not. Okay, so let's continue on. So we understand understand the basic format of all this application, right? We understand that we can do that. Let's go over some of the basic types of um, macros. And we have the ability to open again, as we mentioned, we can open any PDF just like that. And we can also browse for a new document, right? So let's go over the macros. And we have those both for the original document here. We have the same similar macros for the revision. If I want to upload a revision, I can do upload a revision just like that. And it's going to automatically upload that. Once I save an update, it's going to save to that. So each tip specific revision has that ability too. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's take a look inside the VBA, Developers tab, Visual Basic, or Alt F11 is the shortcut there. And we've got document file macros. Those are the macros for the document file. Okay? They're all going to use very similar variables, so we can dimension those all above here. I need to know the thumbnail folder, and I need to know the document folder, right? Those are the two folders that we're going to be focused on here, documents and thumbnails. And we need to make sure that they are put inside the admin, right? If I need to save those documents and save those thumbnails, I need to know what folder to put those in. So we need to ensure that those are accurate. So also, I need to know the full file name, and I need to know the full file path. I also want to know what file type it is. That's going to be helpful when I create those thumbnails. I need to know what file type, because we can also create thumbnails based on Word documents. I want to create that on thumbnails. I'll show you how that works. All we need to do is browse for that. We've got a Word document here. Just click OK. And it's automatically going to create them for the Word document. And all we need to do is just refresh, save, or update that. It's automatically going to refresh. And we see now that that Word document all the way down here, this one right here, is the one we have. So this is the one that we just created. 
When we open that, we'll see it's going to open a Word document automatically here. And then that'll be that. So we can even open Word documents. A lot, a lot of really, really cool features here. All right, so continuing on. So how are we going to do that? So we need the file type. I need the thumbnail path. I need the thumbnail name as a string, right? I need to know the thumbnail name. And I need to know the document folder as a file dialog and the object chart as a chart because we need to create those charts. That's going to help us create those thumbnails. So the first thing what I want to do is run a macro right before this create. I create a macro just to check for the folders. I'll run this macro every time we do. So we want to make sure that the user has uploaded proper folders in for both the thumbnails and the documents. So the first thing, the document folder is going to be based on D3. Then we're going to have the backslash to it. That's our shared document folder. The directory the document folder equals empty or the document folder because I'm be let the user know please set a shared document folder in the admin screen okay also we're gonna do the same thing for the thumbnail which is located in d4 we're just gonna check and make sure that that has an accurate file path if not we're gonna let the user know so that's it so all we need to do every time we browse is just to run this macro and the first one is I want to browse for the original document that is the macro that's been tied to this if we right click on any specific shape inside the group and of course we click assign the macro we see that it is this browse original that we've created. So browse original is the one we're going to first we're going to run the macro check for folders as we do each and every we're going to set the doc file as the application file dialog MSO dialog file picker we're picking a file not a folder so this is going to be file and with the doc file I want to assign a title browse for original document and we're going to allow multi select notice that there's no filter in here no, no, you know, sometimes we add picture filters or sometimes PDF folders or text documents. There's no filter. We're allowing the user to upload any type of a document, and that's really handy with this. We're going to add the file name is going to be based on the directory of the select item. So what that's going to do is extract just the file name, not the full file path, just the file name. This is the full file path right here. Selected items one. That's the full file path. But the directory of that is the file name only. Extract, let's write that in. Extract file name with extension. My auto hotkey does end with. Every time I type in with, it says end with, which is handy usually, but not always. Workflows, that's our sheet name, right? Our sheet name here. This is called our workflow sheet based on the VBA. H5 equals the file name. So I want to take that file name and I'm put it directly inside H5. Once I have that, I want to check, does it exist? I want to take this file wherever the user came from and I want to put it in a specific folder. I want to put it in this document folder. But if it exists already inside this document folder, I want to make sure that we delete it. So we check that with a single line of code. If the directory document file name VB directory does not equal empty, that means it's already in our doc folder plus our file name, combine those as our full file path. If it exists, does not equal empty, then we need to delete it because we're about to copy it over from wherever it's located, from wherever the user has browsed for it. We're going to copy it over into our designated folder. Once this folder becomes shared, it'll be shared with all the users. So we want to kill it, meaning basically delete if it already exists. Delete if already exists. So once it's been deleted, we can then copy it. We're going to use file copy. Very easy. We're going to use the selected item. Remember, this is our full file path of its original location. We're going to copy it. Basically, I want to copy it to our document folder and our file name. Don't forget, we've make sure that we always add the backslash on because our backslashes are not located, but they're automatically added in here inside here so once we run this we create this here this automatically create these variables here and we check for it here because they're also auto updated they're constants up here so that's going to automatically create that and then we're going to use are going to copy it over then what we're going to do is we're going to run a macro called create thumbnail and i'll go over that macro in just a little bit then what i want to do is going to browse for the revision this macro is the macro that we're going to run this is exactly the same everything's the same the only difference is we're going to basically put it in this cell h9 and we're not going to generate a thumbnail off the revision it will be only on the original file name so all we do is just bring the only difference again h9 is where that file name is going to be located and we're going to copy the file just as we did here all right so what about if we want to open a document open the original open the revised document so all i need to do if i want to open that debbie's time off i want to open it here it's going to open that or maybe if i want to open our we already did that the word document we can do that here so that requires us a very simple macro so regardless 
open the original, first of all, I want to make sure that H5 is not empty. If for some reason H5 is empty like it is here, on any time we open it, I don't want anything to happen. So when you click open, nothing's going to happen. So if H5 is empty or H9 in the revision, exit the sub. Going to check for folders to make sure that they're accurate, run that macro. We're going to determine the file path is going to be the admin D3. Right? We could also simply use, because we've already run check folders, we could also use document folder here. Doc, doc folder would be just fine. Right? And the H5, let's do that, doc folder. Doc folder is going to end H5, so the combination is going to open the original. So when I want to open the original, I just click open, and it's going to automatically open that original document. We're going to do the same thing for this. Then the last line of code to open it, this workbook, follow hyperlink, file path. We've got that full file path based on here. Document folder in the workflow. This is the full file path. That's all we need along with the follow hyperlink is going to do it. Going to get that for us. Full file path. Now then we'll open it. Open whatever the document is. Then based on the revision we're going to do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing except we're originating our file name from H9. Everything else is the same. Okay, cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create thumbnails. Let me show that to you once more before I share it. So basically, if I want to create a thumbnail, I'm going to browse for a specific file. Let's say time off Tammy, right? And what I want to do is click open. And that's automatically going to create that for this one, invoice 7. Notice when I save and update that invoice 7 request, now it's going to automatically be updated. See how that did? See, see how it looks different near that thumbnail? When we open that, we see it's the, the basically the time off here. And we created a thumbnail for that. And we're going to use that thumbnail inside that shape. So all we need to do is a few lines of code, and I'll show you how to do that. First thing we're going to do, of course, is we're going to check those folders. I want to make sure that the folders are accurate. Okay, so the next thing we're going to focus on our workflows sheet. So with our workflow sheet, we're going to do a little bit, and that's it. So let's bring this out a little bit. So first thing I want to uh, basically stop the updating of the screen. We can do application screen updating equals false. That's going to make things a lot faster, and they won't flash as much. We're going to set that document folder based on the D3 value in the backslash. It should already be done here, just in case. The thumbnail folder, same thing, D4. We're going to set that shared. I want to make sure that those are set correct. The file name, what is that file name? It's going to be based on H5 value. Remember, this is the one we're creating. We need to create that full file path if it's a PDF. Basically, our folder here, here, combined with our path, is combined with our file name, is going to create that full file path. We're going to put that in a variable called file name. I also want to know what the file type is. I want to extract that. This is a string variable. And I want to extract that, whether it's PDF, .word, or whatever it is, .jpg. I want to extract it. So the best way to do that is we want to find the last period. Here's the last period, right? Because that file name could contain periods. So we want to use in string reverse, meaning it's going to start at the end and work backwards. In string reverse is a great command. When we want to start at the end, the backwards, when we want to move from right to left, when we want to, move, when we want to find a string and we want to move from left to right, we're going to use in string. But we want to use go the reverse, in string reverse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, I want to locate inside that file name, where is that period located? So once it's been found, it's going to give me the specific character number that it's been found at. So let's say we have a 20 character text string and it's been found in the 17th position. So that's going to say it. So then what do we do is we're going to take the entire length, let's say 20, and we're going to subtract out 17. That's going to leave us with three. Right? Then what I want to do is I want to find the right, the right three characters. That's going to leave me with the right three characters of this. And it's going to put that into a string called file type. That's what I want. I only want that. If it's a four digit extension, it's also going to find that because it's based on that period. So whether it's three or four, it's going to be fine. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the file path, the entire file path, put that in there. And that's going to basically be in the document folder along with the I guess I could put file name on this because I have that already inside that file name. And that's going to be the document file path. Once we have that, then what I want to do is I want to do the same thing for the thumb name. The thumb name is going to be basically also want that. So I'm going to replace that. And so what I want to do is I want to create a very unique name for the thumbnail. 
To do that, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we are going to replace it. The file name, in this case, we're going to use a file name. I'm going to look for the period. And I'm first of all, I'm going to replace it with nothing. I don't want to include that period, right? I want to exclude it. So once I remove that from the file name, I'm going to add in underscore thumbnail.jpg. That thumbnail is going to be jpg. So we're adding on, including the file extension for that. So we have our thumbnail name. So we've got our thumbnail name. It's basically going to take whatever the current file name is, removing the period, and adding underscore thumbnail. So we can do that, giving it a unique name. Then we need to build the entire path. So the path is the thumbnail folder plus the thumbnail name. That's going to get us the full file path of the thumbnail based on our thumbnail folder. Okay. Then what I want to do is I want to determine based on the file type. Right. There's a few different things. If it's a PDF, we need to do something. If it's a picture, we need to do something. So if it's a picture, we need to do something. If it's a PDF or Word, we can do something else. So what do we do? If it's a PNG, JPG, JPEG, or BMP, or TIFF, then we know it's a picture. Then picture file. Then Otherwise, it's going to be probably a Word or PDF, L Word or PDF, or PDF. Probably if I would work with Excel too. Okay, so what we want to do now, if it's a picture, what I'm going to do is insert that picture. Dot pictures, we're already inside the sheet. Dot pictures, dot insert the file path. So basically taking that entire path of that picture and inserting it into our worksheet. What we're going to do right away is we're going to assign a specific name for that picture. We're going to call it document thumb. Else, what if it's a Word or PDF? Then I want to create an object called OLE objects. We're going to add a brand new object to our worksheet. We're going to give it the name. We're going to add it. We're going to use it basing it on the file path. That's our file name, right? That's how we know it needs to open that document and create that object. So it's got to know the full file path. Here it is. We don't necessarily need to link to that. And we don't want to display it as an icon. We want to display it as the full object, whether the full word or full. So basically, it opens up a PDF or it opens up a Word document directly inside Excel. So that, so once we do that, and then what we're going to do is we're going to give that object a specific name. Name. That object is going to be the same name whether it is for a picture or whether it's for that PDF or Word. Notice it's the same name. That way we can work with it regardless, moving forward, regardless if it is a picture, PDF, or Word, we can work with it exactly the same. That's all we need to do to differentiate just these three lines of code. Then what we want to do is we want to set an object chart regardless if it is a picture or a Word. We're going to create an object chart, a chart. We're going to set that called object chart. That's the one we've defined up here, all the way up here as object chart as an object. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create that object here. It's going to be basically be chart objects 200 by, this is just the position, the left position, the middle position, the right top position, I believe. Um, just the position, the position doesn't matter too much because we're going to delete it in a moment. What do we want to insert, right? I want to give it a specific width. What is the width of that? I want to give it the exact same width as whatever our shape is, whatever it's a Word document. So we're going to give it a specific width. We're also going to give it a specific height. That height of that chart is going to be exactly the same as that picture or PDF or whatever it is. So we're creating that object that's exactly the same size. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take that shape, whether it is, again, a Word or PDF, we're going to copy that. And we're going to paste it directly into the chart. The reason we do this is Excel does not allow us to save a picture. The only way it does is if we put it into a chart. Once it's in a chart, we can then save it as a picture. So that's what we're going to do. So once we copy the picture, we're going or copy the shape, we're going to activate that chart. Then we're going to paste that particular picture inside the chart. Remember, they're both the same size now. Our picture and our chart are exactly the same. So when we paste it in there, it's going to be perfect, right? Then all we need to do, once we have that, then all we need to do is export that chart into a file. But I want to make sure that if we export that chart into file, that that file name doesn't already exist. So we need to check if it exists, we need to delete it. So we can do that with this line of code. If the thumbnail path, VB directory, does not equal empty, then we need to kill it, right? Once we've deleted it, if it exists, then what we can do is run that export. So all we're going to do is we're going to take that active chart. We've activated it here. We're going to export it based on the file name, that thumbnail file path. And we're going to export it as a JPEG. 
That's all we have to do. Then that picture is now created and it is now in our phone. So it looks something like this. Once it gets created, it looks pretty much like uh, this right here. Thumbnails here. A bunch of pictures is all we have. And you could use even shirts or pictures or whatever in my test. So creating those little thumbnails are here. So we've created those. Now what we can do is delete. Our use for that chart is over. We can now delete the chart. We can also delete the picture. That picture that we created here or here, we can also delete that too. We don't need any of those. Our purpose is only simply to save it as a file. And then also we're going to set that thumbnail file name in B5. I want B5 to make sure that we save that thumbnail. And that's going to locate it right here in B5. So that name, notice, we notice this time off Tammy. Notice we have the file name, then we have that underscore, then we have the thumb.jpg. So that's exactly the name we've given it. Then all we need to do is, which in the macro that I'll go over soon, once we load it up, all we need to do is embed that particular picture inside a shape. We've got a sample shape right here. All we need to do is do that. So it's relatively easy. Good. So now we've been over all the macros that we have on our document file macros. That's all we have to do for that. So that's going to allow us to browse for files. It's going to allow us to open files. And it's going to allow us to create thumbnails based on almost any document type. Okay, fantastic. Now I want to go over some of the macros that's going to allow us to save an update, new a document, or maybe even delete a document. Okay, so how are we going to do that? So if we want to delete a document, we can, but for now, we're just going to say no. So those are some relatively macros. And basically, all I want to do is save this information into this table. And also, I want to save whatever review, whatever current the review is, I want to save that information also to this. And the only thing is we need to make sure in this one, is it an existing or is it a new review, right? So we need to make sure that's going to be based on the database. Like if I select a specific one, we know it's got a specific database here, there. So if we need to make a change, like test, we can make that change, test change here, and we can make that update just by saving it. Okay, so we need to know a few things. Let's get into it. Now we're going to use data mapping. And basically what I want to do is I want to map all these cells including the document ID, including the thumbnail, and a few others, I want to map them to the database. And I've done just that here, something we've been over before. Basically, B2 is that document ID. F3 of that page here, located right here, is right here, F3. And our originator in H3. So basically, we're going to, each column, we've mapped it. And what that allows us to do is run a loop from two all the way to the last one. Whatever's in F3, put in our row. Whatever's in J3, put in our row. What is that row? Well, that row could be based on whether it is a new document or an existing document. Example, if it's a new document, this one's going to be empty. Right? If I've selected an existing one, we already have a row. But if I click new document, we won't have any row in B3. So inside that macro, I need to determine does B3 contain a value or or not. So we're going to do that. All right, so let's get into some of these document macros, and that's here. So we have save and update, which is what we're going to get into. And we also have load review, and we also have new. So the first thing we'll go with in order, it'll be easier. And of course, we're going to start out with some variables. We have the document row as a long, the document column. We have the last column, and I'll go over these. Last results row. Then we have the review database row as long, and the count delay as long. We'll go over those. And the document ID is a string. That could be a, a long variable string. And the supervisor is a string. Okay, first thing basically I want to do is I just want to, with the workflow sheets, I want to create clear out for our new all of the fields that are associated with that. So basically in all the tables, right? So we want to, when we select, when I click add new document, no, I want to make sure we clear out everything here, here, and here, and also including the database row. That database row is going to be stored here. So if I've got a specific change, I know if I'm going to load that, I need to know what the database row is this on. I know it's 46. Remember, that's the database row that's located right here, 46. If I need to save it, I need to know what row, what database row is located. If we make a change like that test change, I need to know what row to place that. So that row is going to come directly from R, and it's going to place directly inside B14. Okay, so we need to know that. So we need to clear out all that information. And I also want to know if the active sheet name code, just in case we're running this macro from another sheet, F3 select, that's going to allow automatically to 
when we click new document, it's going to select F3, which is our first one, giving it a name. The reason we ask if it's like, if I were to select this and I try to run this macro, it's not going to create an error. But if it did, for example, let's say I tried to run it like this. Sometimes you run up this and you get an error and you don't know why. It's like, why did I just get that error? It worked before, right? Watch end. Now when I select this sheet, workflows, go back in here and I run this, it's going to run without an issue. Why is that? Why can I, why did it have a bug one time and not the other? And that is because we cannot select a cell in a sheet if that sheet is not active. If I activate another sheet and I try to run that macro, right, it's going to automatically create a bug. So we always want to, the best way when every time you use select, it's really best to automatically check to make sure the sheet is the same. If the active sheet codename equals workflows only then select, otherwise we can ignore it. That avoids the bug. So now if I'm on another sheet and I decide to run this macro, it's simply not going to select F3, but it won't create a bug. Okay, so that's good to know when you use select because I've seen a lot of the questions in our group about, you know, having issues when we come to select. So that's usually the case when there's an error on select is because you're not on the active sheet that you're trying to select. Okay, so documenting is relatively simple. Not much going on. Document load, when we're loading a brand new document, all we're going to do is clear all the cells. And we want to make sure that B3 is not empty. When I select a specific document, what we're going to do is we're going to place that document ID located here in B2. Once we place it there, it's going to generate a row. If there's no row associated with that, we know that we cannot load anything. We've got to have that document database row. This should be, let's call this database row. Make it a little more clear, database. So we have to have that document database row. So if that's empty, then we can't go forward. So the first thing we want to do is if B3 equals empty, then please make sure to select the document from the document we're floating. Nothing we can do so we can exit out of the sub. We're going to assign that document row to a database. And then we're going to use data mapping, basically from 2 to 11. Why are we not starting at 1? 1 would be our first B2, right? We already have that. We already have that in there. And I'll show you how we get that in there in a moment. But so we can start out, document ID is already there, so we can start out at column 2. Basically, all we're going to do is we have the row inside a variable. I'm going to look whatever's in column 2 and I'm going to place it in F3. We're going to look in column 3 and we're going to place it directly in H3. So we go through these. So that way we can use all, we can load all of this data with data mapping into just a small form very, very easily. I have a video directly only on data mapping. If you want to spend a little more time on that, I've got that called data mapping. You can search for that on my channel. Okay, so we have that. So we've loaded all the data in. So that's relatively small. Now, what I don't want to do is I don't want to load in anything that's been a formula. If we take a look at our office staff here, right? Notice that we have here in B8, or I, let me just double check column 10 on that one. Make sure I got the right one here. Notice here in column 10, which is the review position, B12, B12. B12, I want to make sure this was generated with a formula, with a formula. So let's take a look at B12. Notice the office manager was generated through a formula. So that means I want to know what the position of this team is. And I want to, when I save this, I want to take this office manager and I want to place it directly inside here. But when I load it, when I load it, when I want to bring the information back, I don't need to, right? Because all I need to do is bring Tina back and it's going to automatically update here. If I do put that office manager back, in B12, it's going to clear out this formula. I don't want that to happen. So what we don't want to do, and that's going to be column 10. Notice equals column. This is column 10. So if I change the the back to a general, so so basically for column 10, we don't want to load it. So we could put in a caveat here. If the document column does not equal 10, then bring the information in. And to do that, all we need to do is say the range. This is for the workflows. Based on row one, this is the range in row one. This right here, row one, the document column. So what is that range? The range is H5, B5, F7, F9. So that's what the range is. And that's going to be equal to whatever's in the document database, the document row, and the cell value. That's it. That's all we need to do to load it. That's going to load the particular document. Okay, so when we select that, it's going to load that document. So also we want to load the reviews. Now we're going to run this. Now both of these macros will run when we select. We'll go over that. Just keep that in mind. When we select something, we'll go over that macro soon, but we're going to go in order so that it's organized. When I make a selection, two macros are going to run. When I select this, the load document, which is going to load this information, and I also want to load these reviews also in. 
So that macro is coming up next. That's called document load reviews. I want to load all those reviews. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to clear the contents of any reviews that might be here. Any reviews are here. So L4 through N12, I want to clear that out. I also want to clear out the associated database row here. When we bring the information in from the reviews, right, basically we're going to run an advanced filter. I'm going to bring in all these reviews. Usually you won't have that many reviews, right? And then I want to bring it in. I want to bring this information in here, and I want to bring the rows in here. So we're going to bring that in here. And also, I've been doing a lot of testing, so I got a lot of reviews there. So to do that, we're going to clear out the information first. Then we're going to focus on the review database. We're going to determine the last row. And then what we're going to do is if the last row is less than three, we're going to exit the sub. We're going to run an advanced filter. If we lower this a little bit, we can take a look. Not that much see my purple desktop okay so what we want to do is we want to see this particular code here and I'll go to the document review database so basically our advanced filter we're gonna go all the way from a to through G our criteria is gonna be the 11 right how do we know our criteria well if we link this to our document ID we only want to load those reviews based on a specific document ID. that's linked to workflows b2 we know that that's our document ID the result is going to be only those reviews based on that particular document ID. So we can automatically run it inside our thing. So let's take a look inside here, uh, back here. Okay, here we are. So A2 through G in the last row, we're going to run an advanced filter. We're going to copy the information. I want to set those criteria based on L2 through L3. And I want those results to come into N2 through Q2. So all those results come in. Then I want to determine the last results row in case here, but in this case it may not be so important. We could bring it also. Or actually, I don't need it here this time. Why is that? Well, I don't need that this time. Habit. <laughs> this case we we only have a maximum number of rows, right? So in this case, I'm just going to bring in everything. Normally you won't have that many, so I'm just going to bring in everything. So I'm going to say L4 through N12. We have a fixed number. We don't have we don't because of this design. We don't have it. If we were to move this over, we could have unlimited. So. But I wanted to save these because these are all dynamic as we add more. So I kept it that way. So basically, I only have a limited number of reviews that we want to show. It's enough. So L4 through N12 equals, basically, we're going to just set the number of rows. So we want 10 rows also from here. So we're just going to set the first 10 rows here. It's going to be all the way to here. So all the way through, in this case, N3 through P12. So we do that just in line code. L4 through N12 equals N3 through P11. And we also want to do that with the database too, right? The workflows R4 through R12 is going to equal Q3 through Q11. So I also want to bring over these database rows, at least the 10 rows, and bring them directly over inside R right here. It's going to bring them all over, okay? Because we have a fixed number of cells, so we don't need the last row in this case. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the last row is in our results because we're only going to bring in 10, which should be sufficient based on this design. Okay, so we've got the reviews there. So now what are we going to do? I want to save and update this. How are we going to save and update? Well, again, I want to make sure that we have, first of all, all of our required fields. Remember, we went over that. So B1 has to be 5. Right? If we Anything less, we need to let the user know. If B1 does not equal 5, then we just let them know, please make sure to fill in all the required fields. And we're going to exit the sub out of it. Now I need to determine, are we is this a new document or is this an existing? As we mentioned before, B3 is going to tell us that. If that row is empty based on an error, then we know that it is a new document. There's a few things we need to do if it's a new document. If it's a new document, I need to sign the next ID. We're going to use the max formula. We've got the formula here, max of all the document IDs plus one. If there's an error, I want to return one. Why would there be an error? Well, there'd be an error if there was no data. So I want to basically determine the max of these. In this case, the next one would be 19. If there's no data at all, I'm just going to return one. There would be an error. So if there's an error, it will be one. That's going to get us the max of them. And it's going to sign it. So if it's a new document, we know to assign a brand new document ID and our based on our first available row, in this case, 22. Okay, so we would do that. If B3 is empty, we know it's a new document. The document row is going to be based on the first available row inside the document database plus one, which is the last row with a value plus one, our first available row. I also want to get the next document ID. I want to place that next document ID directly inside B2. It's going to come directly from B4. It's going to be placed in B2. I also want to take this next document ID and I'm going to place it in column A right here. 
Okay, so we do that with just a few lines of code here. B2 is going to take on B4. Also, the first column here, column A, and our document row is going to take on B4, next document ID. Also, I want to make sure that if F9 is empty, that I want to sign in just in case they're, they have not added a reviewer. What I'd like to do is add the current originator to the current reviewer before, basically before they've decided to assign it to another reviewer. It's assigned to themselves and then if they decide they can then drag it down over or move it to the next one. But first it's currently assigned to them. When you create a document, you haven't given it to your manager yet, it's still in your possession. So you want to make sure that you assign it. So the current reviewer is the originator if they haven't set so F9 is empty, then what we're going to do is simply going to take H9 and we're going to place it directly in F9. So we do that with this. If F9 equals empty, let's just put in no reviewer manager set. Then what we're going to do is we're going to set the default reviewer to the current staff. Okay? F9. That's it. Just to make sure that we set that up. Okay. If it's an existing document, we're going to do something else. All we need to do is extract the row from whatever's in B3. That's it. That's it. Whether it's new or existing. Now the rest we do automatically for both. So again, we're going to use data mapping, the same thing we did, but this time it's in reverse. Whatever is located inside our range is here. It's going to be placed inside our database based on the document row and document column. Again, we're looping through from 2 to 11 here. From 2, because our document ID is already here, regardless if it's new or existing, it's already here. From 2 all the way to the last row, including where the formula. Remember, we don't need to account for 10 because we're placing it here. It doesn't matter if it's a formula. We want the results from 2 all the way to 11 taking whatever's in F3 and placing it here, whatever's in H3 and placing it here, or whatever row we've set. So that's going to do with just three lines of code. Next up, what I want to do is I want to save the document review only if the review exists, right? If F9 is not empty, which it shouldn't be, but if it is, I want to save it. If F9 is empty, I want to save the review. So we have to also save that inside our document review. It's got to be saved. Maybe we've added a review here. It's got to be saved at the first available or... If it's already existing, save in whatever row. How do we know if that review is existing or not? Well, we can look directly to our database row. We know if B14, right, if, we, if I click new document, we know B14 is going to be empty, right? But if we click an existing one, it's also going to be empty. But if we click an existing review, we know it's going to contain that database row. So B14 is going to let us know if it's existing or not. So that's going to be inside the code. If B14 value equals empty, then let's just put new review row. Okay, existing. So new review. Let's just put new review. So if it's new review, I want to get the first available row based on our review database. And we're going to determine that being last row, of course, with a value plus one. And then what I want to do is just same thing. I want to place the set the database row. B14 is going to take on that row. Remember, we've just created it. So B14 is going to take on that first available one. And then also I want to do is I want to set the ID. That ID must be set inside here. I want to know that particular document ID. We have to place that directly in A for those new ones. So A is going to take on whatever's in B2, setting that document ID. I also want to know the row I'm going to put that in. So the row, both the row document ID and the row, those are only for new. We only need to set that once and that's going to be for new review. So it's going to be set in A and in G we're going to set that row. We're setting a formula and that way if we delete a row, the row will maintain correct. Okay, so we have that there. And now what if it's an existing row? Then all we need to do is extract the row into a variable based on what is in B14. That's it. That's for both new existing. So the rest is simply updating or adding to the database. We're going to add into the database. We're going to set the current review time and date in column B. We're going to set the staff name in C coming from F9. The revision, if there's a file name in H9, coming from H9, F10 is going to take on the notes in F12. So basically all I'm going to do is just take all the information from the reviewer, the revision, look the notes and the status and just placing it directly in the the date, the reviewer, the revision file, the notes, status and all and all sorts of that. So that's all we need to do there to handle that. Okay, great. So that pretty much is going to save it. That's all we need to do. The last thing, once we save it, I want to run the macro that's going to refresh the reviews, right? Because I, if we've added a new review, I want to refresh this list. Notice there's a, there's let's say one here. This one doesn't have a full list of review. So if I add a review here, I want to make sure that we add that automatically here. So if we test that here and then we save it, I want to make sure that that review also gets updated here. 
okay notice we've just added that here so we want to make sure that we update the list of reviews here so i'm going to run the macro that loads the reviews that's the macro we just went up here load the review so all i want to do is refresh that adding any changes that we made in here and i'm also running the macro called workflow refresh that's going to refresh it that way any changes that we've made i wanted to make sure that it appears that macro is going to refresh this list we're going to be going over that soon as well last thing is document delete that's relatively easy b3 we need to make sure that there's a row associated that we want to let the user know do they want to delete it yes or no if they do we're going to sign that the row the database row document delete we're going to set the document id and then we're just going to delete it from the database and then we're going to refresh the workflow and then we're going to run a macro to new so basically we're just deleting the row associated here simply just taking whatever row deleted now again if you want to add more i would suggest you delete all the reviews associated with this by running an advanced filter we just didn't get to that because we got a lot running that advanced filter sorting it based on rows right it's a lot it's a lot of work to do just for delete sorting but i'll tell you the right way to do it sorting it based on the highest row first the lowest row and then pulling the row into a variable deleting the row deleting the row row and row so basically going through and deleting those rows associated so that's how you would do it if you want to delete but for our purposes it's not necessary today but that's what you might want to do. if you're selling it you certainly want to delete the associated reviews with each document okay moving on so now what i want to do is i want to load a review that's a simple macro when i select that's a simple macro. When I select on a review, I want to load that up, right? If I know that we have a database row associated here, all I need to do is just load it. So when I make a selection change, that's when I want the macro to run. When I make a selection change based on anywhere from L4 all the way through N12, that's when I want it to run. So let's take a look at that. The originates back inside our workflows, work fix, and based on selection change. When I make a selection change from L4 through N21, I want to make sure that L contains a value, right? If I select on something that doesn't, nothing would happen, right? Only when we select value. In that case, I want to run a macro that's going to load the review details inside here. Okay, so we want to load everything up. So what we want to do is B17 is going to take on the target row. I want to put that. That we need for conditional formatting. B17, remember that's our re selected review row. As we select it, notice B17 changes. I also want to take that database. I'm going to put it in directly in B14. So that's the next step. B14 is going to take on whatever is in R and the target row, bring over the database row. Once we have that, we're gonna run the macro called review load. That is the macro that we're gonna go into right now, that's here. So with the workflows, we wanna make sure that B14 uh, contains a value. If it's empty, we're gonna exit the sub. We gotta have that database row, right? We're gonna assign that to a variable called B14, right? That's the variable here, B14. Once we have that, all we need to do is just go into the review database, whatever's in C, which is our staff name, whatever's in D, which is our revision file, right? Basically, we're just going to go, whatever's in C, or review name, or revision file, or notes, or status, and bring it directly over into the individual cells. We could have used data mapping for this too. F9, or H9, or in this case, F10, or of course, F12 is going to take on all that information just with these lines of code. That's it. That's review the load. Okay, great. Everything works fine. Perfect. I want to assign a macro. When I click on a button, I want to assign a macro. The best way to do that is we're going to duplicate these. Notice that when I select something, they, all the shapes get deleted. But there's a macro that I want to send. That macro that I'm assigning to these shapes is basically called macro select. It's we're going to use a sample here. When I create this, we're using this sample. If I assign this macro, if we look into the individual shapes, if I assign a macro to these, when I duplicate, sorry, it's off the screen, it's called assign macro, it is this macro, document select, that I've decided to assign to our sample shape. Our sample shape is simply a group, right? This basically, it's just this item here and this item here, this shape here. So text box here and the shape here, this one folded corner. If I want to update that, I want to change it, I can change it. Notice it's going to automatically change in the ones we created. So you see now the, the fold. So basically our sample is going to be the original document. So all I need to do is assign a macro to this shape and this shape or just the group as a whole. And it is that macro called document select that's the macro so when i select something right it's the macro that i want to sign so how are we going to do that well if we take a look at this name here right, if i take a look at this name let's go ahead and update this we take we right click on here and we can see it's called document group 12 the name that i've given it basically we're going to say document group and then this 12 is actually our document id so when i select here notice 
12 comes up here. And this one here, there's a macro running now. That's why you can't see it, believe it or not. And this one here, you it's basically, if I select on that, it's 13, right? Document ID 13, okay? So we can see that once the macro finishes running, and I'll explain why that macro is running. Basically, the macro is waiting for us to drag and drop it. So once it finishes, we'll be able to see that ID up here, here, document 13 group. You can see it here, 13. So what I want to do is I want to extract this 13 from our document name. I want to extract it. Or what I want to do is from the individual shapes. This one's called document THM, short for thumbnail, THM. And this one's called document NAM for the document name. Now, the point is what we want to do is we want to make sure that each of these shapes, there's basically two shapes in this group. I want them to make sure that they have the same number of characters, document NAM and also document THM, same number of characters. Because what I really want is I want that number and I want to extract it. If I take out the first number of characters, if they're both the same, it's going to leave me with the document ID. And that's just what we do inside that. And I want to place that ID directly in B2. So how do we extract that from the name? Remember, we don't know if they've selected on the thumbnail and we don't know if they've selected on the text. So the best way to do that is simply to remove the same number of characters. So we can do that with just a little line of code here called replace. We're replacing the application caller. Application caller is the name of the shape that called the macro. We don't know if it's a thumbnail. We don't know if it's a text box. So what we're going to do is we've given it the same number of characters. So I'm going to take those 11 characters, which is all the text, and I'm going to remove it based on that. So we're going to use the left of 11 callers. I'm going to take all the first left 11 characters, and I'm going to replace those with nothing. What's that going to leave us with? It's going to leave us with that document ID. It's going to call this extract document ID from the shape name. And that way, whether it is a single character ID, such as one or two, or double, like 11 or 12, or even if it's 115, it's going to automatically extract because we're taking away everything else. Okay, So I'm going to take that, I'm putting that into a variable. Okay. Then what I want to do is I want to set the move document to false, B18. That will come in handy a little bit later. Basically, you're going to take B18 to false. Okay, That's going to come in handy. So then what we want to do in B19, I want to set that left position, and I want to set the top position. What I want to know is when I select something, I want to know the left position of that shape and I want to know the top position. Why is that important? Because if I decide I'm going to drag and drop that, Excel needs to know whether it's been moved, right? And I need to know, that means if the left position has changed or if the top position has changed, we need to know that so that we can tell Excel as we're running the loop, hey, there's been a change, we should make the update to the team leader or you know, or whoever it is, we should update that. So that's what we do inside here. But the first thing what we want to do is set the current position. So I'm going to set the position, the set initial left position based on the document group. Remember, this is the group as a whole, right? We have individual names. The group as a whole is named called document group and then whatever the ID is. So if we've extracted that ID and then I add document group, we've got the group name. The group is where I want the left position. I want to set that left position in B19. Again, it is that group position where I want to set that top position located in B20. Once I know the left position, then I can compare it. So basically, when we move this, it's going to it's going to run a loop, and I'll go over that macro very, very soon. It's going to run a loop. Hey, has that top position changed? Has that left position changed? If it has, get the up, get the new persons right. Or even you know, if there's no name, we need to hey, there's no, nothing there. Don't move it all the way over there. You got to actually assign a macro. So we need to know the difference. So setting up the initial left position and then top position is going to help us determine if it's been moved. Then what we're going to do is we're going to just going to simply load the macro that's going to run the reviews. We've been that. And we're going to load the document load. Those macros are over there. So when I select it, all I need to do is take that document ID, make sure that document ID is located in B2. Once it is there, I can then run the macro to load it and also run the macro to load the ID. So it's going to load here, load that list of IDs here. So whether it's a sales order or whatever it is, it's going to load those reviews. 
one macro to load the reviews, one macro to load that. So all we need that required is B2. It's going to take on that and everything else will happen. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the document group. Basically, what I want to do is when I click here, I want that shape to be selected. That gives the user the ability to drag and drop it very easily once we select it. So very easily to do that, all we need to do is actually to select the entire group. We can do that with this shapes document group document ID, select, select the document group. Then what I'm going to run a macro, I'm going to run a macro, it's called workflows check for move. That's the next one coming up. And basically, it's just going to run a loop and it's going to continually check and check and check for a number of seconds to see has the user moved it or not. If it has moved it, then make the update. This is going to be super easy. So let's take a look inside here. Inside the VBA, it's going to be called workflows check for move. And basically what this macro is, we're just going to check to see if the user has made a change to the movement, you know, change the position of the group. If they have, we're going to check, is it an accurate move, right? If, if it's not, right, if they've moved it somewhere crazy, we need to let them know, hey, you can't move it there, and then just refresh it. But if they've moved it to a correct position, then we just need to let the user know, okay, good, and then move it. All I need to do is then pretty much update the supervisor and move it into its new position simply by updating the database and then go ahead and refreshing it. So we can do that with just a little bit of code here. First of all, I want to make sure that B2 contains, we've got to have an actual, of course, document ID that's located in B2. If it's empty, we can exit the sub. Document ID is going to put that into a variable B2. Then I'm going to run a count from one all the way to 100,000. And that's going to put us a delay, right? We need to give the user some time to make the changes, right? If they've selected on something, give them some time. If it's too quick, they won't have enough time. But we, they might want to move it, you know, a, few, a little while after. So we want to do that, giving them some time to move it. So we're going to start that. Now, it's during a macro, so we need to allow them to do, make some changes during while the macro is running. So do events is going to allow us to do that allows the user to make some changes while the macro is running okay i also want to check is has changes been made so is if it should continue running as long as b18 is false b18 is false continue running and checking and checking and checking as soon as they make a change we're going to set b 18 to true. That's going to allow Excel to say, okay, we know that an update has been made. We should make those changes. So B18 is going to let us know whether a change has been made. So that loop will continue running as long as B18 is false. So B18, if it's true, we're just going to end. It's going to end the error. Once the document has been moved, we're going to do that. Okay, so how do we, first of all, now we need to check to see if the document has been moved. So we're going to focus on that. We've got the document ID. We know the name of the group is document group with the document ID. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check if the left position is different than B19 or the top position is different than B20. Again, that's where we come in. If the left position is different than B19 or the top position is different than B20, then we know the user has made a change. The next thing we do, we need to check, is it an appropriate change, right? Is it a correct change? If it's too far to the left, we need to let the user know, please make sure to move the document to a workflow containing a supervisor name, okay? So it's too far over there. So, and then of course, refreshing the screen. So we can do that with this. If, right, left is less than F1, F, they'll call the, in this case, of course, the row doesn't matter. I want to know the left position of F, right? If it's, if here's F, if it's before that, we need to let the user notice it's before that. It's less than the left position of F. Let the user know. Or maybe if the top position is less than 15, in that case, move it over, right? So let them know. So here, if the left position of the group is the less than the left position of column F, then, or in this case, this case, all I need to know is work order 14, right? In this case, we're going to check for a proper supervisor. The supervisor is located on row 14. So I need to check the column of the shape, the column, the top left cell of that shape. What is the column of that? If that if that column in that row equals empty, what does that mean? Here's here's 14. Here's our supervisor, right? And let's let's do time off. That's an easier one, right? If there's no supervisor here, in case this one, we need to let the user know, hey, don't move it there. We need to have a supervisor. Notice the column, right? If I'm moving over here, this column is all the way over here. 
that's not going to work. We need to make sure that the column that they've moved it over contains a supervisor, right? We have to, we're going to use the top left cell for that. So this is our check top left cell column plus row 14 is it empty if it is that means no supervisor so that or another one or maybe the top position is less than f15 right remember f the f doesn't matter in this case if the left position is the of row 15 if it's below that if it's less than that then we know it's also not good as we mentioned before less than that would not work as well. So we need to check on those three conditions. If any one of those three are accurate, then we need to let the user know, please make sure to move the document to a workflow containing a supervisor name, and then refreshing it, right? We want it, We want to completely run the macro. This macro will be next. We're going to run that macro that's going to basically refresh all those back to the way it was. So quickly, if they moved the wrong one, just click OK, and it's going to return right back to the way it was. Okay, great, but what if it, then we're exiting the sub, but what if it was a correct move? If it is a correct move, then what I want to do is I want to determine the supervisor located here, and I'll go over that form in a moment, the supervisor located in whatever column they've moved it over to and row 14. So that supervisor is going to be in a string variable, which is the workflows row 14 and the top left cell the column of that shape the column of that shape that is the supervisor name supervisor name and all i need to do is take that name supervisor name and place it directly located in here in f9 so that's what we're going to do next f9 is going to take on the supervisor name i also want to set the status in f12 to pending set the status giving it a status so when i move it right i want to set that status to pending it's going to set that that is, which is pending review. Remember, pending here, here, this is the named range, pending. Remember, I told you we're going to create those named range. It's going to make it a lot easier. It's called pending review. So as we change this, it's automatically going to change. So that's going to give it that pending review. So we've done that. Then all we need to do, again, set move to true. Right? This, this lets them know that a change has been made, setting that to true. What is that going to do? Why is that important? Because as soon as it goes to true, it's going to exit out of this loop because as soon as B18 goes to true, it's going to end. That means it won't keep looping and looping and looping. As soon as it's going to end that. So we set that to true. Then it's going to exit out of that loop, right? It's going to go down here. We're going to make sure that B18 is true. And then all we're going to do is just save that. But before we do, we're going to save those changes. So automatically, when we save those changes, that new position is going to be automatically set. That's the macro, of course, we're going to go over next. And that's the macro that automatically refreshes those based on either selection or load. So cool. So we understand how to move it and how to save it because it's as soon as we save it, right, as soon as we add that new review, as soon as we add that new sub, it's going to automatically change very easily. So that won't work because that's not far enough. But if we move it a little bit farther over, it will work just fine. Great. So we've gone over all the macros. But what I want to do is I want to share with you how do we create this really cool so that all these shapes go in here. That's going to be based in our module called Workflow Sheet Macros. So it's called Workflow Refresh. That's the one I'd like to go over with you now. So the first thing what we want to do, again, I want to check to make sure that we have a thumbnail folder. In this case, though, we can still, if we don't have a thumbnail folder, I would like to display that even if I don't have a thumbnail folder, let's say we make that folder, thumbnail folder incorrect. Let's say we just add something onto it so that it makes it incorrect, right? I'd still like to display them, but we won't have to display thumbnails. Please select a folder in the admin screen. They're still going to display, but without, let the user know, hey, put in the thumbnails, but it's still good to have them. Even if the thumbnail folder file path is incorrect, it's still going to have the shapes and still going to work, just won't have those thumbnails, okay? But when we do, so notice that they're there, they just don't have the thumbnails. As soon as we make sure that that path is accurate, they're going to show up. So we want to give the user a warning, but we don't want to exit out of the sub. If the thumbnail folder directory equals empty or the thumbnail folder is going to display document thumbnails, please set a thumbnail folder in the admin screen. But remember, we're not exiting the sub. No need to exit the sub. Documents can be displayed without the thumbnails. It's fine, right? But, you know, sometimes you won't have a thumbnail for everyone. So we don't need to exit out. Okay, so first of all, I want to check for the selected flow row. What is that? That's going to be located in B15. Remember, I need to know what is located in that flow row. B15 is going to be that select row. What row? Is it work order? Is it sales order? B15 is going to tell us that. So we have that. And if, there's, if that's empty, please select a flow type. We need to know that flow type. Very important because I need to know 
what type workflows to type? What are we going to look at for time off? Are they going to be expenses less than a thousand? Are they going to be expenses greater than a thousand? I need to know which ones we have. So we need to make sure that that contains a value. Why is that important? Because when I basically use our advanced filter, I only want workflows based on the sales order. I want to run an advanced filter and it's going to be based only on a specific workflow type. So we need to know that inside there. Great. So we're going to, if there's nothing in B15, we can exit out of the sub, right? That's very, very important. Continuing on. Okay, we're going to set the selected row to basically as a variable inside whatever is B15. That's our selected flow type row. I also want to clear the existing documents, right? I, if I'm refreshing it, I want to make sure we delete all of these. Now, notice they all have the word document in it, document. Our sample doesn't. Our sample is called sample doc group, D-O-C group. It doesn't have the word document in it, not the full word. So what I want to do, and I want to make sure that no other shapes have the word document, I want to delete every single shape that contains the word document document. To do that, we can just run a little bit of a loop. In this case, it's going to call for each document shape. This has been defined as a shape. All the way over here, document shape as a shape. So for each doc shape in shapes, right, we're already in the shapes. If in string, the name of that contains the word document is greater than zero, meaning it does then delete the shape. So for every single shape on our worksheet that contains the word document deleted. Okay, we're going to be recreating them so there's no need to keep them. Then what we want to do, again, I want to set B18, set move true to avoid loop. I want to make sure that we're not going to create any loop. So I'm going to set B18 to true just in case. Why would that happen? Because if I click here and I refresh it real quick, it could be a you know, an issue. If I decide to save it very quick, I don't want to create a, a loop, right? So that way it's going to exit out of any loop that might be coming up. So setting true exits out of to avoid any loop. Okay, then what I want to do is I want to clear the existing positions and document counts. So B2, F15, F101 through P101. What does that mean? I also want to keep track of how many documents are here, right? If I move this document here, I can't have them appear on top of each other. I need to know that there's two documents in this column or three documents in this column so that they don't appear on top of each other. Let me move that over so we can see. Or three documents. So we need to keep track of how many documents are in a single column. Well, I'm going to put that all the way down here in row 101. One, notice it's three. I need to keep track of it. VBA is going to do that for us, but I need to keep track of how many documents are in a column so we can know that. So we're going to put that inside B101. When I refresh the schedule, I'm going to clear out F all the way through, let's say P or something like that, F101 through P101, clearing that out. We don't, once we clear it out, VBA is going to keep track of it. So F101 through P101 gets cleared out. B2, the document ID. Also, F15 through P15. F15 through P15. Let's take a look at that. We also want to make sure that we are clearing out everything through here. All the, everything through here. F15 all the way because these, these types are also based, these are based on whatever we've selected in the time off or whatever. The, so they're based on that. So they're coming from here, right? The sales are here. So if I change to time off, I only want to load these four. So we need to clear out everything that's located in F15 and throughout, right? So we're going to update them automatically, but we want to clear out the existing ones. Once we select them, then of course our supervisors will appear here. So we're going to clear those out. We're clearing all the existing positions and document counts here. Then what we want to do is B16 is empty. What is in B16? Let's take a look. B16 contains our type row, right? We need to make sure we've got a type row here, right? Here, what is that? Notice it. Remember, that is our type row here. Types are located here. Time off, one, two, three. We're going to use, how do we get to that? Of course, we're going to use just that simple indirect. We're matching on the workflow types. We're running, we're going to use indirect, D, and I want to know what row it's in. We could use a match for that. That will work too. I want to know what row it's on. So we have that. We're going to the B type if I want to get a column. So we're going to start out with B16, right? One, two, three, or four. But what I really want is not just the one, two, or three, or four. I want to know what column it is. For example, time off is placed in six, right? Because I want to get all of the staff positions here. I want to determine the last row and I want to loop through them all to determine that so I can place them directly inside here. 
And so if I click time, I want to place them directly in here. Well, to do that, I need that column. So the first thing we want to do, if we know one, if we know the first one's one, and we know the columns in six, all we need to do is add five. So adding five is just what I did here. The here, our company workflow column, company workflow column is located in B16 plus five. That's our admin workflow column admin company let's call this company because we set up those company workflows and then once we have the column i want to determine the last row based on that right the last row is going to be the last possible row in this case it's going to be 18 18 i say in this case a lot 18 all the way down right so get that last row in this case again there's that word 11 right i'll think of something other than in this case in this instance, I like that better. In this instance, 11 is our last row. So we want to run a loop from 8 to 11, taking all those and placing them directly in our row here, starting on F and then moving through. Okay, so we can do that here. So if the last row is less than 8, then of course, please make sure to add a company. There's got to be at least more than one 8. Then what we're going to do is we're going to turn off application screen updating. Okay, we don't need this one here. That's not important got a better way around that so we're going to run this loop for the company row is going to be a to last so basically i'm just running a loop from the admin starting with eight and going to the last row for each one we're just going to basically update the rows here starting of course in column six and row 15. so case cells right from our 15 right that's our row company flow row to minus two well what is that we know it's starting we know it's going to start in row eight right we're looping we're starting in row eight but this row eight must be placed in the column column six here so if i know that row eight must be placed in column six i only need to do is subtract two and that's just what i've done here the flow minus two that will give us six so row 15 column six value equals the admin cells the company flow row company flow column value so that's going to basically set run that loop it's going to be placed to direct every single one one two three four all the way from here regardless of whatever is going to set so here we go in this case it's a lot here and so we have a lot of them basically on this so that's going to regardless of the column okay so that's just simply going to load those company workflows basically on that so all we need to do is that so once we have those loaded we can then move on so that's all so that's basically all we're going to do with the workflow section next up what we want to do is run that advanced filter remember we need to run an advanced filter i need to know two things one is it a sales order and two i want to make sure that it's not been finalized right so i want to make sure that the workflow is a sales order and the current status is not finalized so that is going to do it so our current status does not equal and then final there's that named range again final so whatever we have placed in here called final whatever we place here is not going to equal that so those two instances if those two instances are true right that it is a sale in this case it is a sales order and it is also not final. i want those results to appear here we can do that with an advanced filter that advanced filter will go through right now so here we go with the the document database here we're starting out here document database the last row we're getting our last row if the last row is less than three then exit the sub we're running our advanced filter based on a3 let's pull bring in that database here starting at a3 all the way to k3 we need those headers making sure and then our criteria is s2 through t3 so our original data a3 through k using the header row i'm going to run an advanced filter our criteria is s2 through t2 then also we want the copy to range where are we going to copy that to i want those results to appear ad2 all the way through a and two that's just what we have here 82 through a and two okay once we have those i need to determine the last results row i'm going to use ad column ad we're going to get that last results row if that last results row is less than three then we can exit out of the sub it's, it's 11. so we can do that the last results row based on ad you're going to get that if the last results row is less than three then exit the sub with the workflows now we're gonna so we focused on the database we've done that now we're going to focus back again on the workflow sheet for the results equal three to the last row i need to loop through every single result three to the last row we need to extract some information the first thing what i want to do is i want to make sure that we actually have a no a reviewer that reviewer actually al that's got to be we need to have that if we don't have that we're not going to know where to place it right if i'm here i'm not going to know where to place it so we have to know where we're placing it we also need to know the position we've got to have that position here they have to have a position 
chairman stuff. If there's no position, of course, I'm going to change that to AM. That should be AM. I like that better, right? No, no reviewer position. More, more important. Okay, let's exit out of there. And position here, position. Okay, so no review position. I like that better. The document ID, that's going to come from AD. Here is AD. I want that document ID inside a variable. We're going to put that inside doc ID. The name is going to come from AE. You can see that above. We're going to also know the position of it. What is that position? I need to know where that reviewer position is. It's going to be based on AM. AM, that very important position based on AM. Then I want to know the thumbnail name. That's going to come from AJ. Here's that thumbnail name. That name is going to come here. Notice they all end with thumb, right? We have to have those file names. When we combine this thumb along with our thumbnail folder here, it's going to be a full file path. So we need to pull that. I also need to know that thumbnail path. Remember, that thumbnail folder plus the thumbnail name is going to be the full path of that thumbnail. I'm going to set the position range. What I need to do is I need to find that position. Or I'm going to set the position range here. I need to find out, right? If I know that, let's say, here's our position coming from AM in a variable. If I know that position is office staff, where is that office staff? What column is it going to go? It's going to go here in column F. But what if it is vice president? If vice president, we need to put that in column M. I need to find out which column we're doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a range located starting here in F15 all the way to the end. And we're going to look for that position and find what column it's located in. We can do that with this. Set position range is going to equal to F15 all the way through P15. We're going to find, what am I looking for? That position. Remember, that position is coming from AM directly here. That position is coming from AM. We're going to look for that. We're going to look it in the values in the hole. If, it's been, if it hasn't found, if it's not found, then we can skip to the no document. There's... Right? If it's not found, I don't know where to put it, right? So we can't, we can skip to the next one. So if position is nothing, means it's not found, then go to the next doc. It's going to skip everything and go directly down here. Assuming that it has been found, we can continue on. That position column is located the position range, the one that's been found on a dot column. That is the column we know. Now we know what column to place it in. Once we have the column, then what I want to do is I want to determine the left position. What's the left position of that? Well, the left position is basically the left position. We can use row one of the cells. We're in the workflow. The left position of that column. And I want to add one. It means I don't want it directly on that column. I want it one pixel over to the right. So we're going to move it over a little bit to the right, one pixel. I also want to set the top position. Now the top position is a little more technical because we don't know the top position is going to be based on, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. It's really based on how many are inside here, how many our documents are located in the single column. We need to keep track of how many. It's going to be located on row 101 and whatever the column is associated. So Basically, the, the top position is going to be based on the current top position based on row 16, right? I wonder, though, we're going to start out with row 16, the top position, but we're going to add to that. Well, we're going to add nothing. If this is zero, we're going to add nothing. It's going to be placed right here. But if it's one, basically, I want it to be one times the height of this. One times the height, then we're going to place it one down. If it's two, it's going to be two times the height of this. We're going to place it in the third. So that's how we're going to be doing it. So again, the top position here, let's go down here. The top position here is going to be start out at 16, plus we're going to add something. What are we adding? We're going to be adding the height of this. I want to add a little spacer, right? I don't want them right on top of each other, times whatever the value is in 101, that's the number, right, plus 2. So basically, we're going to multiply this. So basically, if it's if we have 1 here already, and if it's then all we need to do is add 1 times the height. That's going to be our top position, okay? So all we need to do, we're using the value here. And so as we add more, all we need to do is increment this. Every time we add 1, every time we add an increment, we incre increment this by 1. That's how we keep track of it. So I'll show you that as we come along in the code. Okay, so that's going to set our top position based on the current documents inside the same column. Then what I want to do is I'm ready to create it. So now we've got the top position. Now we've got the left position. We know everything we need to do. We've got the thumbnail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sample here, this sample group, and I'm going to duplicate it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this part. This part here is called sample document thumb. I'm going to rename that, and I'm going to rename this sample document, giving it brand new names. 
The macro has already been assigned, so we don't need to create it. We don't need to assign another macro. So we do that here, shapes, sample.group. We're going to duplicate it. We're going to assign it a unique name. Remember that name, document group, and the document ID. That's the unique name. We've already defined the document ID up here. Okay, so once we have that, we can focus on that with shapes, document, document ID. So I want to set the thumbnail. Now what we want to do, that thumbnail, we're not going to set to the entire group. We're only going to set that thumbnail based on one of the items inside it. So what is that? This shape here called sample document thumb. That is what I actually want. So I want to do two things. One, I want to take that and I want to fill it with a picture. How do we do that? Well, basically all I need to do is select here, right click, format the picture if I were doing it, fill and then fill it with a file. So we'd fill it with a picture. That's all I would do there if I were doing it manually. We're doing using VBA. So basically, that's all we're doing, just filling it with a picture. But we're doing it with this particular shape on the inside called sample doc thumb. So inside VBA, we're going to highlight that with group items sample doc thumb. First thing I want to do is I'm going to rename that shape. I'm going to rename it to document THM, document thumb. Remember, those 11 characters, very important, and the document ID, because we need to remove those 11 characters when we want to extract the document ID. Okay, once we have that, then what I want to do is I want to make sure that the document, the thumbnail path is accurate. If it is, document, the directory, the thumbnail path, VB directory does not equal empty. That means it's a good one. It's a good path. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add fill, right? We're already inside this with the sample, with this item, filling that particular shape with the user picture based on that thumbnail. This basically adds thumbnail picture as background. So perfect. That's how we have it. That's it. That's all for the thumbnail. Now what I want to do is I want to, I got one more thing to do. I want to take this text box here, sample doc name text, and I want to add the name of the document. So basically whatever the name, the one that we extracted here from AE, I want to put that in the text box. So we can do that with just a little line of code. So document sample doc name. Again, I want to assign it a name, giving it that unique name. Again, another 11 characters here. And then giving it that document ID. We're going to assign it some text. That text is going to be based on the document name. That document name we've already defined up here based on AE here. Giving it that text name. Text frame 2, text range, text equals doc name. Sets the document name. That way each one has an individual document name. And again, with this particular shape, notice it's kind of transparent. If we look in the home, right, in the format, actually, we can do the shape fill. And then we have more colors. I've given it a transparent. Notice it's 27% transparent. So that's all. If we wanted to make it you know, solid, we could do it here. And then also, all we have to do is the solid one, and it would be solid, right? So if we wanted to make it a little bit transparent, or maybe we want to change the color, right? If we, want to, if we do that with just this, it's very, very easy. We can easily make changes. All we need to do is just change that, right? Let's say you wanted it dark, and maybe you wanted the text in this case white you could do that right and it would be very easy let's select all the text the entire text here and the entire shape make that white right so now when we run the sales order it would automatically be up so you can very very quickly and easily up to I like that a little bit better maybe okay return it back to the way it was all right so it gives a nice kind of look so we all we need to do is simply change the sample and everything changes below that okay so we sign it that name now what we want to do is we want to set the group position the rest is easy we've already defined the left position so we can set the left left position of the entire group left position so we're, we're out of here we're inside and outside of the document name here we're inside and outside of the thumbnail but we're still inside the group as a whole so we can set the left position and we can set the top position set top position and i also want to set the width the width is kind of easy because that way if we change the column width we can also change the thing so the width of that shape is going to be based on whatever the column is that we're placing it in so the position column minus four so slightly less than the width slightly less than the width of the column that way there's some spacing we just set the width that way if we increase the column right and we simply rig it, it's going to automatically notice it increased automatically so i like that better because it increases with the column so it's a little bit easier and you can you don't have to change much it just automatically increases so that way we set the column width okay great so the last thing what we want to do is I want to increment that cell. Remember, I've got to update. Once we've placed it in the column, I need to update. Whatever's here, I want to increment it one more. So we do that with just that single line of code. Cells, 
101, whatever column we're working on, equals whatever's currently there plus one. Remember, when we refresh this entire macro, we're clearing it other out. So as we're working through all of the particular documents, we're incrementing the cell. So that automatically updates that top position here as we add more. So notice here, this updated to zero, right? So notice it's not here. So if I change this, right, and I bring it over here to one, it's automatically going to change to one. When I drag and drop it over, the macro runs, this updates to one. So we've got that. It gets a nice track of it very, very easily. All we need to do is simply refresh it. So next result will. And then the last thing is application updating true. So that is how we automatically create these very, very cool things. Okay, so now we've got a few more to show you. We may want to send something to the next. We can drag and drop, but I also wanted to give you another option. What if we just want to click once and let's say, oh, we need to select on, let's say I want to select on something and I want to move it over one. We can do that with one single button with just a few lines of code. And we've done that here called send to previous revision, or in this case, send to next. Let's bring this back up here. So we've got send to previous, send to next, approve and next. So maybe you just want to do one click where you can approve it in next. So if I want to click here and I want to approve it, boom, it approved one button will do that. So how are we going to do that? Well, all I need to do is determine if there is a uh, supervisor in the next column, making sure. Obviously, if we're in the last column, we can't do it here. We need to let them know, hey, there's a problem. Make sure to move this document to a position containing a supervisor name because there's no next here. So all we may want to do is return it back to the original person. That So maybe we're on here and maybe Tim says, oh, we've really messed this up, Hank. You know, you got to go back. I want to return it back to Hank here. So I just click back to Hank and that's going to automatically bring it back into Hank's column here with just one that's back to the original. So those are the few macros that we're going to show you. They're all very similar. So the document approved next workflows. Of course, we need to make sure that there's a document ID. If B2 is empty, there's nothing we can do on, so move it along. So assuming that we do have a document ID, we're putting that inside a variable here. We're going to set the document shape is going to be equal to the document. So we're setting that shape up here. Now the document shape, if it's nothing, right, then just we can't move something if we don't actually have a shape. So we're just checking to make sure that we actually have a shape. Then what I want to do is I want to determine what is the current position of that cell. What column, what, what is the current column of this, right? I need to know if it's H, I need to check the column next to it to make sure that it has a supervisor. So we need to get that into a variable. It's going to be based on that shape, the top left cell, the column. What is the column of the current shape? Then what I want to do is I want to check the column next to it. So the column plus one, if that's empty, that means there's no supervisor. So we need to say, please make sure to move this document to a position, you saw that message, containing a supervisor name. That way we can't move it to somebody else. Okay, but assuming that there is a document, then all I need to do is change the update. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to pending review or pending remember. It's that in this case, we're gonna use pending pending here that's the named range here set this to pending and whatever the next person here is i'm going to set this into our pending our current reviewer so if i take this and i move it over one i am automatically going to set tim over next to it and it's going to be pending and then just simply refresh the schedule once i've changed it here and i save it right that's done through vba setting this, setting this, saving it, then refreshing it, automatically it's gonna appear here. That's what we do in the next line of code. F12 is gonna equal pending. F9, of course, that's the reviewer name, is gonna come from the row, row 14, the position column plus one. That's gonna set the reviewer name. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clear the notes and revisions. H9, I wanna clear anything, H9, A, I, N, clearing everything else, just to make sure because it's brand new review. So I wanna clear here and I wanna clear here. So we can do that here. And then what I wanna do is just run document save and update. Once it's saved, it's automatically going to refresh. All right, previous review is exactly the same, except just we're gonna check the column previous, right? So if we wanna move it back to the previous supervisor, we can do just that with here. Again, we're gonna run all the same checks here. This time we're gonna check position column, we're determining the column. I wanna check the column before, before that. Right? If it's empty, we want to make sure to move this document to the previous column. Okay. Also, I should put here or, right? Or I want to check also 
making sure that it, it is also, if it's column, what column is that? We want to make sure that if it, that this is column, let's do equals column, right? We know that this is column, or if it's column, let's column six, right? Then we know that column six, they can't move it over again. So let's, let's add to that. Or let's do it up here in the if statement here, if or position column equals six, right? That would be all the way over left then, okay? So that way if they try to move it over, even on the left one, right? If they click here and they try to do that, we also want that message to come. They can't move it left if they're on the first staff. Okay, so the position column one is empty, right? So now again, we're gonna do the same thing. We're, this time we're gonna put needs review. I'm assigning this a different status called needs review. That one here is gonna be called needs or needs revision or needs review here. Right, so that's what we're all we're going to be doing here. Now they've got a macro running, so that's why it didn't show up. Needs review here, that's the one we want, or needs revision here, so that we can send it back. And then, of course, the reviewer name is going to be the previous supervisor in the previous column, also on row 14 minus one. That's the reviewer name. Again, we're going to clear out the notes and revision, we're going to save it as it is, and that's going to automatically re redo it. Perfect. Okay, but what about the original? What about sending it back to the original person, right? I want to send it back. If this is Hank, I want to send this back to Hank. How do I do that? Well, basically, all I need to do is take whatever is in H three and place it directly inside and maybe add something like rejected here. We do have one called rejected. So maybe we have one here called rejected. We can do that with there. So how are we going to do that? Well, we do that with just a little bit of code. Again, everything's the same. But in this case, F9 is going to equal H3 set to the current review. Remember, F9 is going to take on the originator located in H3. And also, I want to make sure that we've taken the rejected. Notice we've got a name range called rejected here. I want to place that directly inside F12. So we do that here. F12 equals rejected. And then clearing it out and saving updates. So that's it. That's all we have to do to send it back to whoever we want. We can easily navigate. We can use two ways. We can use drag and drop, and we can use also think uh, the uh, just the buttons here to to automate it. So relatively simple. This one automatically adds a specific status, which is really helpful. So we have a specific status. So if we select on one, we know that we're going to have a specific status. Okay, we've gone over everything but how to get these things. And basically what I want to do with this is I want to check here, what is the supervisor? I want to look for the supervisor of this, or I want to check is, first of all, if B8 equals F15, this formula here, I want to know, what does that mean? B8, B8, let's look in B8. Again, remember we had that original staff. If office staff is here, remember this is set by VBA, but if the position of Hank Evans is the office staff and this he was off, then I want to put his name here. But what if it's not? I want, to, I want to put his supervisor. I want to basically put his supervisor. So what I'm going to do in that case is I am going to index the staff position. I'm going to run a check. Is his supervisor, is the supervisor a team leader? If the supervisor is a team leader, we're going to put it here. So it's a little bit of a complex formula, but I want to just simplify it for you and basically say we're looking up a specific team leader. Here, I want to look up who is the team leader of Hank Evans. If it's Craig, put Craig here. So who is the team leader? So once we have a value here, I want to look it up and put it there. So it's reflective of that. I'm not going to go over this entire formula. We've been over a lot in this. It's already an extra long video. But I want you to study this formula a bit. Okay? And basically, we're looking to the staff before and seeing is who is the team leader of office manager. If it's the correct office manager and have the correct position, we are simply going to place the name of that staff directly in there. That's it. That's all we're going to do. And we're just going to run two checks because maybe we're going to skip one, right? If we skip one, let's say we don't go in the exact order. Maybe we want to skip. So there's two checks. One we're going to check for the current leader and one we're going to check for the staff after. So there's just basically two checks, okay? All right, very, very cool. We That was a really amazing training. In this training, I showed you how you can create this really cool drag and drop document workflow manager, complete with ultimate reviews. We've got have save and update and document and data mapping. We also have added the ability to dynamically create thumbnails based on PDF, 
Word documents, or pictures, and how to also move them over and track them down and embed them inside shapes that are also dynamic. An incredible document workflow manager. I do appreciate these. If you like these trainings, you want to help support us, Patreon is a great way to do it. I've got tons of stuff going off on Patreon, and I'm adding more. We've even got discounts and early birds. You've got PDF code books. I've got tons of great features there. So I hope you visit us on Patreon. Sign up there. Lots of great things I'm putting into that. All right, that link will be down below. Thank you very much for visiting us this week. I appreciate your time and your effort that you're putting in to learning and educating yourself. I guarantee you it's going to pay off. We'll see you again next week for another incredible training. Thanks so much.